for a quick vote on a resolution, but seeing the absence of a quorum, shh, seeing the absence of a quorum, uh, we, will, we will just go right to the hearing. We try our best to accommodate members, but if members don't show up, we have to proceed and move forward. Uh, okay. Uh, so Good afternoon. I am Council Member Mark Traeger and Chair of the Education Committee. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to thank the members of the committee who are here, Council Members Deutsch, uh, Kalos, Cornegie, uh, Cohen, and Gredenchik. Uh, today's oversight hearing is on fair student funding. We will also hear testimony on three pieces of legislation uh, I am sponsoring proposed introduction number 1014A, introduction 1174, and resolution 569. To be clear, we are not voting on these bills today. I will talk more about this legislation shortly after some opening remarks. I'd like to welcome Lindsay Oates, DOE's Chief Financial Officer. This is Lindsay's first time testifying as the CFO at DOE and I very much look forward to working with you this year. One of my primary concerns as chair of the Education Committee is ensuring schools have the funding they need to support and educate students. That is why I traveled to Albany last year to advocate for increased state funding to support a fully funded fair student funding formula. However, state funding last year fell short of meeting this goal. So I advocated to DOE and the administration that it is our responsibility as a city to fully fund all school budgets if the state cannot meet its obligation. I'm very happy to say that the administration did listen last year and provided $125 million to raise the FSF funding floor from 87 to 90 percent. However, this is not enough. We cannot pick and choose to fund some schools at 100% of their FSF entitlement and not others. We do not have a school system that is built on equity when the mayor's priorities dictate which schools get 100% of their funding. The administration has made funding choices I would like to challenge. How do you decide to only support renewal in community schools with 100% FSF. How do you decide to open new schools with 100% FSF but not provide additional resources to schools that have been struggling financially for years? I also support community schools and funding new schools at 100%, but I support all schools being fully funded so that every school can provide the array of academic and supportive services that students need to learn and thrive. A fully funded FSF formula should enable schools to provide the complete range of educational programs students need. And I know this funding has the biggest impact on students in schools. With adequate funding, schools have real choices on how to best support their students. Social workers and guidance counselors can be hired. Additional support for vulnerable students to overcome barriers to learning can be provided. Enrichment programs in the arts and sciences can be offered. These services should not be a rarity in schools. These shouldn't be hard choices for principals. These programs and supportive services should be provided to every student in every school. For example, a school in Brooklyn has the, the biggest gap to reach 100% FSF at $5.8 million. Let me repeat, a school in Brooklyn has the biggest gap to reach 100% FSF at $5.8 million. That is a lot of money for a school. That money can support entirely new counseling divisions or academic programs. It's approximately 10% of the school's budget, 
So you have to ask, how is the school operating without this funding? How is the school able to support students' educational needs? Out of a $32.3 billion budget, $16.8 billion is being used to support fair student funding. This is a lot of money, larger than some city agencies' entire budgets. And after 10 years of FSF, there are still, council members, please. And after 10 years of FSF, there are still 1,169 schools receiving less than 100% of their entitlement. This is not acceptable. And that brings me to another point I'd like to make about today's hearing. We're here today not just to advocate for increased resources to school budgets, but also to examine the FSF formula itself and determine if this is really the best way to fund schools. Do we need to add weights for students with educational barriers not captured in the formula? For example, a poverty weight is only used as a proxy for academic performance before fourth grade. But shouldn't we take poverty into account for students in all grades? What about students in temporary housing? Don't they face educational barriers we can address in this formula? I do not necessarily have an answer to these questions, but it's time we talk about it to make sure this is the best method to support the educational needs of all students. According to DOE's own estimate, it would cost $756 million to fully fund school budgets, including the pension and fringe costs for teachers and schools. This number is growing larger every year, so why hasn't this been done yet? In a budget of $32.3 billion, it seems like an obvious choice to me. As I stated earlier, we will also hear testimony on two related bills in a resolution which I am sponsoring. Proposed intro 1014A would require a single reporting bill on Department of Education spending allocations, including fair student funding for schools citywide. This bill would increase transparency over DOE's budget by requiring a machine readable, sortable, and searchable reporting bill on spending allocations for all schools three times per year. Introduction 1174 would create a fair student funding task force including representatives from DOE, OMB, the council, principals, teachers, and advocates who specialize in working with vulnerable student populations to review and make recommendations relating to the formula used by DOE to determine school funding. The task force would consider the, the categories, types of students, grade levels, and weights that will best result in funding allocations to meet the needs of the most uh, vulnerable. And these uh, recommendations will be presented to the mayor, to the chancellor, and to the city council. And finally, resolution 569 calls on the DOE to factor in poverty as a weight in the fair student funding formula for schools beginning at fourth grade or later. I'd like to remind everyone who wishes to testify that you must fill out a witness slip, which is located on the desk of the sergeant in arms near, near, the, near the, I guess, the back of the room. Uh, to allow as many people as possible to testify, testimony will be limited to three minutes per person. I also want to state again that we will not be voting uh, today on, on, on the legislation that I just described. I'd like to thank the Education Committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Beth Gold, Jan Atwell, Karima Johnson, Elizabeth Hoffman, and Caitlin O'Hagan. And finally, I'd like to thank my staff, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, and Eric Feinberg. Um, I think we've been joined by additional members. Councilmember uh, Rose, Councilmember Barron, and Councilmember uh, Borelli, Thank you, Council. and Councilmember Brennan. Can we have the so we can do the vote? Okay, so since we have quorum, we can quickly do the vote, and we'll get right to the uh, testimony. Okay, um, so the Education Committee will be voting on Resolution 358, sponsored by Councilmember Cumbo, calling upon the City of New York to eliminate the disparity in compensation paid to teachers, staff, and directors at community-based early learning New York City centers as compared to the compensation paid to Department of Education instructors for similar employment. The committee first heard Resolution 358 at a joint hearing 
with the General, well, General for Welfare Committee, chaired by Council Member Levin, on June 27th, where we heard testimony from DOE, ACS, unions, parents, advocates, and others. I hope my colleagues will join me in voting for this resolution as the city has an opportunity to fix this disparity right now as early learning services that were once under ACS are moving to DOE, giving DOE oversight over the full system of early childhood programs. With that, I'll ask the committee clerk to call the vote. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on education, resolution 358. Chair Traeger. I vote aye. Ampre Samuel. I vote aye. Barron. I vote aye. Cohen. Aye. Cornegie. Aye. Deutsch. Aye. Kalos. For the third time today, aye and all. Rose. Aye. Gordenchik. Aye. Brannon. Aye. Borelli. By vote of 11 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, resolution 358 has been adopted by the committee. And thank you for my colleagues. Uh, one last thing before we uh, ask the administration now to testify is that I very much, as I mentioned in my remarks, commend uh, the mayor, the chancellor, uh, uh, working with us in the council uh, because Speaker Johnson, Chairman Danny Drum, myself, uh, and, and the council made funding FSF a, a big priority in the last budget. And $125 million is certainly a significant investment in our schools, and we greatly appreciate that. But I must also state before we begin that I've heard from a number of school communities that their FSF increases were also eva evaporating because of increased individual school costs, particularly when it comes to the issue of uh, veteran teachers and their salaries. Uh, the schools are responsible for paying the average cost of the teacher salary in the building. And the system currently almost penalizes schools for maintaining experienced veteran teachers that mean so much to our school communities. And so some schools were actually in the red or they saw their FSF increase completely evaporated because they had to pay uh, for the average cost increasing to cover the cost of teacher salaries. So the system almost creates this dynamic where some schools are afraid to continue holding on to the cost of veteran teachers and prefer rookie teachers because the salaries are lower and it lowers the average cost. That's, that's a twisted system. And so th that's something that I would like to also have addressed during this hearing today. Uh, we need to make fair student funding more fair and uh, to make sure schools actually appreciate and actually see an increase in their school budgets. So with that, I'd like to swear in, oh, we've also been joined by Councilmember Amprey Samuel, Councilmember Drum. Uh, they could vote very quickly as well. Well, I think, yeah. Resolution 358, Councilmember Drum. I vote aye. The vote is now at 12. Yes, we'll, we'll swear in the, the panel. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to Councilmember questions? You may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Chairman Traeger and members of the Education Committee. My name is Lindsay Oates, and I am the Chief Financial Officer of, at the New York City Department of Education. Seated with me is my colleague, Dr. Laura Fehu, Senior Superintendent of Labor and Policy. I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss this important topic. How we allocate resources to schools is one of the most important concerns for the Chancellor and for me as CFO. Personally, as a public school parent, it is also one that is very close to my heart. I look forward to working together with you to continue to increase resources allocated to schools to provide all New York City students with an equitable and excellent education. 
Guaranteeing all New York City students have access to an equitable and excellent education has been a key focus of this administration. Under this administration, we've cumulatively made $4 billion in new education investments through our equity and excellence for all agenda to support our schools and to improve student outcomes. This includes over $800 million over this time period to raise the fair student funding floor, which is the lowest percentage at which a school can be funded. This year alone, these floor raises have increased school budgets by over $350 million. The vast majority of, F of the FSF funding increases have been dedicated to those schools previously receiving funding at or near the floor. At the beginning of this administration, the FSF floor was 81%, with the average school at 87%. It has been a top priority of ours and yours to raise the floor every year, and last year, with the partnership of this council, we were proud to jointly announce a floor of 90%, with schools across the city receiving an average of 93% of their FSF. Additionally, as part of our targeted investments at our most historically underserved schools, including renewal schools, are fully funded at 100%. We are grateful to Speaker Johnson and Chairs Traeger and Drum and the Council for their support and look forward to our continued partnership. Beyond our increases in FSF, we have also made critical investments to ensure that all students have access to rigorous curriculum and instruction at every grade level. Through our Equity and Excellence for All agenda, our students are, start, are, are starting school earlier with access to free, full-day, high-quality education for three-year-olds and four-year-olds through 3K for All and Pre-K for All. We are strengthening students' foundational skills with universal literacy and algebra for all. We are providing more support to our students along the way with college access for all, single shepherd, and community schools. Our investments are yielding real progress our graduation rate is at 74.3%, the highest it's ever been, while our dropout rate, 7.8%, is the lowest it's ever been. College enrollment and readiness are also at record highs. For the third year in a row, New York City students outperformed the rest of the state on English language arts and are continuing to close the gap with the state on the state math exams. I would now like to speak in more detail about the Fair Student Funding, or FSF, formula. FSF is one of the most important tools we have to ensure our schools are funded equitably, providing additional resources to schools with higher needs, students. Prior to FSF and the centralized decision making under mayoral control, superintendents set budgets for their schools. As a result, schools were funded differently across and sometimes even within districts. In fiscal year 2008, to meet the goal of education equity, the DOE implemented the Fair Student Funding Formula. FSF is driven by equity. The students' needs are at the core of the formula, and the data shows that it's been successful in advancing it. Per capita budgets are higher at schools with high concentrations of students in poverty, students with disabilities, English language learners, and schools with lower math and ELA performance and graduation rates. FSF distributes funds employing a weighted student funding formula. Simply put, this means that a school's student population and their needs determine the majority of that school's budget. The weights in the formula represent the relative funding schools need to meet the instructional mandates for each need. FSF funding starts with funding each pupil based on their grade level. Then needs, or weights, are added to the formula based on the pupil's English language learner status, special education needs, academic intervention services, career and technical education programming, among others. FSF also includes $225,000 to fund basic administrative expenses, such as the principal's and secretary's salaries. In recent years, we have also included collective bargaining costs associated with the staff currently employed at the school. The formula strategically targets more funding towards schools with the greatest level of need. Data regarding each, student's, or each school's students' needs feed into the FSF formula and are updated twice a year in order to be responsive to changing student enrollment and needs. 
At the school level, principals work throughout the year with their school leadership teams and superintendents to determine the right way to meet these needs for their students. Schools dedicate a majority of this funding towards staff. 96% of FSF dollars are spent on pedagogues, including classroom teachers, guidance counselors, social workers, and paraprofessionals. In addition to raising the floor, every year the DOE evaluates the FSF weights to ensure that they represent the cost of meeting each student's instructional needs. The DOE consults with superintendents, community education councils, and ultimately the Panel for Educational Policy prior to finalizing the weights for the upcoming school year. For example, in fiscal year 2017, the DOE updated its weights for the English, English language learners by creating bilingual weights, weights for students who had achieved English proficiency, and weights for students with interrupted formal education. This directed an additional $40 million annually to resources, in resources to students who are learning English across the system. The funding for FSF comes from city tax levy and state dollars. Federal funds, as well as state and city funds that have specific statutory requirements or policy mandates designed to meet particular academic and community needs are not part of FSF. However, the vast majority of school budgets, approximately two-thirds, are allocated by FSF. In 2007, the promise of new funding owed to the city as a result of the Campaign for Fiscal Equity decision brought the hope of every school receiving 100% of its FSF. The thought was, once new funds were received, all schools would be funded equitably. However, as we all know, the state funds never materialized. The remaining obligation from the state to the city is $1.2 billion in this fiscal year alone. As a result, our system has schools below 100% of their FSF. For this reason, you will often hear that a school is funded at a certain percentage of its FSF, meaning that even as we are allocating more resources to our school than ever before, we are still painfully aware of the gap that remains. That is why in past years, when state funding was sufficient to cover existing mandates and more, we used the additional funding to increase the FSF floor. The Chancellor has emphasized that our schools must be equitably funded. The DOE always strives to direct any available funds towards the schools who need it most. However, the city simply cannot afford to close the gap alone. It would cost the city approximately $756 million to raise all funds to 100%, all schools to 100% of their FSF level. In order to achieve this, we need the state to fulfill the promise of the Campaign for Fiscal Equity. We are grateful to the Council for your advocacy in Albany, and we look forward to working with you in the coming legislative season to push for that funding. The DOE is deeply committed to financial transparency. New Yorkers deserve to know that their tax dollars are well spent, and parents deserve to know that schools have adequate resources to educate their children. The DOE posts extensive school and department budget information on our website. We publish financial status reports, or FSRs, six times a year, which detail department-wide budget changes, including current year budget and spending. The most recent FSR was published in September. And our website also hosts over 10 years of FSR archives. We publish every school allocation online with a memorandum explaining its use, as well as an exhaustive guide to FSF. Additionally, for every school, we publish a full accounting of the math behind FSF allocations. Each school's allocation and budget is updated daily, and a rep retrospective school-based expenditure report, which calculates per-pupil spending for every school in the system. All of this information is available on the DOE's website for anyone to download and view. This year, we've published school-level budget information in a new report. This report includes in one spreadsheet not only FSF information for each school, but also enrollment and staff information, how schools plan to spend their budget, and detailed information on pre-K and community schools. 
In the coming years, we plan to continue to expand this important work so that parents, advocates, and elected officials have access to clear, digestible information about their school's budget. We are committed to this work and look forward to having an ongoing dialogue with you and the public on this topic. I would now like to turn to the legislation being considered today. Intro 1014A requires the creation of a report that would include information on all school level budget allocations and FSF for each school. We support the spirit of this legislation and would like to work with the council to align reporting requirements with both our school year and our fiscal year. Intro 1174 creates a task force to review FSF. While we support the spirit of this legislation, it that seeks to ensure that the FSF is reviewed by a variety of stakeholders, it is important to note that FSF is reviewed each year through a community input process that involves every CEC as well as the panel. Each winter we present, take questions, and receive feedback from every CEC on the FSF weights for the upcoming year. Following their feedback, we propose final weights to the panel which votes following a 45-day public comment period. We want to work with the Council to ensure that the proposed legislation aligns with existing processes for input on FSF. We know that the most important investment a city can make is in its young people. We believe that our investments will help ensure that students in every borough, district, neighborhood, and school have the tools they need to achieve their dreams. With record high graduation, college enrollment, and college readiness rates, we are seeing evidence of success to build upon. We look forward to working with the, working with the council to ensure that FSF continues to be equity focused and that the state fulfills its fiscal obligation and provides funding so that all of our schools can be funded at 100% FSF. Thank you again for your time and the opportunity to testify. Laura and I will be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. We just want to note that we've also been joined uh, by council members Levine and Lander and give them an opportunity to vote on resolution 358 as well. Council member, Le <clears throat> council member Lander. Vote aye. Council member Levine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I vote aye as well. Vote is now 14. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Oates, for your testimony. Uh, this is sort of a just historical background question first. Uh, are you aware of anyone in the DOE currently who actually worked on creating the original FSF formula? And have you spoken to them and gotten information about uh, what went into the process, what did the process look like, how long did it take to come up with that formula? Because I understand it, it, it was created after the CFE lawsuit. So if you can just speak to that, I, I'd be curious to hear some background on that. Sure. Uh so there are a few folks that remain in our office who are part of the original um, creation of the FSF formula. And uh, I believe the process was uh, a very time consuming process and a thoughtful process that involved engagement um, of a variety of different stakeholders. Um, there was, um, I should say, tremendous consideration for what the different weights should be as well as um, not only what the demographic characteristics should be of the weights, but what the calculations of the weights themselves should be. And as a reminder, the Fair Student Funding Formula, as I said in my testimony, was created um, both after mayoral control, but also in direct response to the anticipated new funding that we would receive from the Campaign for Fiscal Equity, um, which is the, the lack of those resources in foundation aid have resulted in our um, situation today. Right. When you said that it was created with a variety of stakeholders, which stakeholders? I believe there was consultation that occurred between, um, certainly internally, with the guidance of all of our internal city partners. I can't speak to the specifics of who was engaged at the time, but I can look into it and certainly get back to you. I would appreciate that. And you said it was time consuming. Uh, when was FSF implemented? FSF was implemented in fiscal year 2008. And the CFE lawsuit decision was? 2007. So 
it took a year for that formula to be created? It was a significant change, as you know, in the way schools were funded. And so I think there was a lot of thoughtful process um, to ensure that schools were not harmed in the transition of the old school budgeting way to the new. And Laura, who was a principal at the time, could probably speak to what that felt like at the school level. I was actually a principal in the days when everything was sort of line itemed and it was specific. And a lot of the conversations and the transition around how do we budget funds to su specifically support the goals identified in a school leadership team for a comprehensive education plan. And so by bucketing those funds and providing fair student funding for the actual students you had in your school and weighted in that way, you were provided with a more reasonable estimate of what it took to educate kids. Right, and do you, do you remember, uh, Dr. Fehu, did you begin with 100% of FSF? So I was actually a principal uh, before 2003, and I joined, uh, at the time, Chancellor Joel Klein's team in 2003. So I was a superintendent in 2003. So that was prior to uh, the actual budgeting. As a superintendent, I can certainly say to you that I think schools felt more supported in the ways that they could use funds that weren't specifically line items. Right, uh, and Ms. Oates, when the system was, when FSF was implemented, did every public school in New York City receive 100% of their entitlement? That's not my understanding. W what is your understanding? My understanding is that they started um, at a floor and we ultimately did not receive the funding that we needed. There was one year where we received an additional amount of foundation aid, which then we quickly as a nation went into the recession and ultimately did not receive the... Did any school start at 100% of their FSF? So when, yes, yes. Right, and when you look at the list today, you still see inequities because there are some schools at 100%, there are some schools at over 100%, and there's reasons for that which I, which I have uh, read through but there are schools that are still at 90 percent and th these gaps are significant in terms of cost and dollars so and for my colleagues it's just very important to understand that fsf or the city tax levy dollars is probably the most precious funding stream for a school it gives the school the greatest flexibility in terms of investments in that school building with other funding streams like title uh, one others there are stringent guidelines on, on the use of those dollars. This, this stream, which was created after the Campaign for Fiscal Equity lawsuit, allows principals in school communities to make key targeted investments, social workers, guidance counselors, additional APs, uh, art programs, music programs. Uh, this is a very, very important funding stream for our schools. Um, FSF has now been in use for 10 years. Uh, do you believe the formula has resulted in equity in funding across the city? Yes, yes I do. Yes, I do. Um, our data shows that we are funding uh, students with the highest needs with more, more funding. Uh, well, we're gonna challenge some of that because some of the, some of the, the weights, I think, are, are questionable. Um, which leads me to my next question. What is the uh, methodology used by DOE to determine the appropriate FSF weights? So the weights, um, thank you for the question. I'm gonna get a bit weedy. Um, there are many weights, as you know. There are about five different buckets of weights, general ed grade weights, academic intervention weights, English language learner weights, special education weights, and portfolio school weights. And I can walk through what the distinctions are for all of those, but schools can receive more than, or excuse me, students can receive more than one weight. If they are a third grader, that is an English language learner, as well as a special ed student, they will receive weights for all of those different types of things. So it's not just one weight per student, you will receive a weight associated with all of the needs um, in that is, you know, makes up the registers in your school. Um, 
So the general ed weights, the grade weights, I should say, count for general ed and special ed students. There's a K to five weight, six to eight, nine to 12. Those different weights fund classroom teachers um, as well as basic OTPS costs and general sort of support for those teachers. Again, it's, in, it's supposed to fund the instructional needs in the classroom. Academic intervention weights um, fund academic intervention services, supplemental instructional supports and interventions, push in, pull out teachers, um, et cetera. English language learners, this is the set of weights that most recently changed as a result of CR Part 154 from the state a couple of years ago, which changed the instructional time requirements associated with this um, need of students, as well as um, adding some new distinctions to this population. But in general, these weights um, provide the teacher to provide these ser services, um, as well as uh, reduce class sizes, um, as well as sort of the mandates for um, students who are transitioning out of the ELL uh, uh, designation. We also created a weight for students with interrupted formal education. Those students, as you can imagine, have very unique needs, and so there, there is now a weight to support those specific needs for students. The special education needs weights um, provide funding to support the self-contained and ICT classroom models which have a lower class size as well as a multiple teacher model. Um, they also provide coverage for some um, academic intervention services. The portfolio school weights provide weight funding for CTE programs and some transfer schools, et cetera. Uh, those are what the weights are designed to fund and, um, and they're again supposed to support the basic instructional classroom needs uh, of the school. Uh, how is the initial weight of $4,084.80 set? So that's a, that is a dollar value that is uh, calculated by our office every year. We look at the average teacher salary um, without collective bargaining associated with it, and we end up calculating the per capita based on the number of students. You look at the citywide average salary or the building salary? We look at the citywide average salary. But the, build, but the school building is being charged the average building salary, not the citywide average salary. Correct. So isn't that a problem? We think that schools um, in general, our experience is that schools hire teachers based on their level of experience and what their specific school needs and not necessarily based on the financial constraints in their budget. And Laura can speak to, to that decision making process. So certainly. So when you're looking for a teacher, you're looking for the right teacher for that program and for that class and for the needs of the school. And if the average teacher salary is not something you're considering when you're hiring teachers, you want to find the right teacher, the best teacher for that program. Over time, if your average teacher salary is a little bit higher because you have a few more experienced teachers, there are benefits associated with that. Um, otherwise, more less experienced teachers who come on board also have needs in terms of development and being ready. And so I think principals are always looking for the best possible teacher for their school and are not weighed into thinking about whether their average teacher salary is going to go up over time because you're certainly looking for the best people for each position and every position. Uh, Dr. Fehu, are, are you suggesting that principals have not shied away because of budgetary constraints? from veteran teachers because of cost? I, I would absolutely say that when you have a highly experienced teacher, you are getting the benefit of their experience. And I would also argue that not every experienced teacher and every inexperienced teacher lead you to a conclusion about their quality. I think teacher quality can span from a new teacher to an experienced teacher, and there shouldn't be a categorization that uh, this or that is better. There are well, great I, I people out there. I agree. It's just I am relaying what I'm hearing directly on the ground from school communities, not from advocates, not from unions, mm -hmm. from my direct conversations with educators on the ground, that some schools were even afraid that they couldn't even open because they were so much in the red uh, because of, of the, this is an issue that I think needs to be addressed because it's my understanding that in the past, they did account for the average citywide average salary. Uh, they used to be called it's a unit of appropriation. Uh, that's 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 from having some professors that had historical knowledge and from hearing from from folks. So 
I think we need to revisit this issue, but I, I would like to, uh, to move on. H does the DOE consult with any external organization or stakeholders in determining any of these FSF weights? So as I said in my testimony, we consult um, with the CECs every year. We go through a rather exhaustive process when, um, during the winter leading up to initial school budget allocations um, to make sure that each CEC is briefed on what the fair student funding formula is for the upcoming school year. And uh, the, there is a 45-day public comment period for the weights posted prior to when the panel um, votes on it. Uh, we do have members of our staff that participate on national fair student funding um, committees to learn about best practices, or I shouldn't say fair student funding, weighted student funding. This is a model that's used throughout the country. Um, and so we are trying to keep up to date with what is um, best practices in this regard um, nationally. Well, I mean, I, I can't speak for all CECs, but those who I uh, work with had concerns about um, some of the weights, and I'll get right into it. Uh, in January uh, 2007, DOE released a Fair Student Funding Guide that explains why FSF was created and describes the intentions of the weights within the formula. According to the guide, poverty was intended to be a weight for all grades based on free lunch and public assistance data provided by HRA. According to the guide, experts recognize that poverty brings greater need for example, a uh, CFE report found that poverty had an especially substantial influence on cost. However, today, poverty is only used as a proxy for academic performance before fourth grade and is not a weight for all grade levels. Uh, first, can you explain why is this the case and has DOE considered adding poverty, adding a poverty weight beyond the, the third grade. So I, I appreciate your advocacy for this um, high needs part of our population. Um, we are aware that this is an active conversation here and in other places. Um, we believe that our formula is designed to fund students' needs, and it does, in fact, fund students' needs. Um, schools with concentrations of greater student needs receive more funding. That said, um, this is an active work stream, and I think we'll have more to say on this topic uh, in the coming months. I would like to work together on this issue because yes. as we see, also the number of students in temporary housing have increased, and this is an issue that we, 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 we must address. I noticed that there's also a wait for CTE schools, is that correct? Yes. Um, what constitutes a CTE school? Uh, CTE, well, let me, let me let Laura talk to that, please. Uh, career and technical education. So schools who have a sufficient number of programs that are geared towards uh, areas uh, of certification for students in you know, uh, medical billing and other uh, CTE areas. Right, but that also requires that the programs are certified to be CTE. And in order for a program to be certified CTE, you need a num certain number of teachers who are certified to teach CTE. Is that correct? Yes. And is it also correct that this remains a major challenge for the DOE to have teachers and schools become certified in CTE? Is that correct? So the challenge is actually the certification process correct. that's a state process. Right. And so uh, recently the state is using other methods in which we can certify professionals in the field so that they can uh, be teachers in this area. The, the certification process is one that's owned by the state, and we need to make sure our teachers are certified, even if they have the capacity to teach these in those areas. But there is some flexibility with that, and we have been able to secure people in the field who also have state certification to teach those areas. Okay, uh, in the interest of uh, just my colleagues' time, I'd like to, uh, I'll turn to them for some questions as well. Uh, sitting very patiently, uh, Council Member Barry Grudenchik. I don't know how patient I was, Mr. Chairman, but thank you uh, just the same. Uh, thank you and welcome, Ms. Oates, Ms. Fajou. It's good, always well, good to see you. Um, to be generous, uh, you know, I look at the list of fair student funding in my district, um, and it doesn't really seem to me to uh, bear much, um, I don't know what the right word is, semblance to reality. Um, I have 
a fairly affluent district. Um, I have, it seems to me that some of my Title I schools, not all of my schools are Title I, some come close, um, seem to do worse in fair student funding uh, than my non-Title I schools. And for starters, I was hoping you could explain to me why that discrepancy exists, because it certainly does. So uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the fair student funding budget in schools is dependent on registers. So the fair student, generally speaking, the fair student um, funding budget for schools that have more students will be higher because it's based on a per capita for each student. Um, and also, the, as I said before, based on the individual needs of those students, schools that have students with greater needs receive more funding under the formula. It doesn't seem to be the case, though, because I could tell you the tale of two schools, uh, 109, which is a Title I school in Queens Village, where we now have a waiting list, I'm very proud to tell you, um, and MS-74, which is smack in the middle of my district, surrounded by homes that go for seven figures in some cases, um, not a Title I school. And the fair student funding formula was lower at 109 than it was at 74. And I've had many discussions with the esteemed chairman of this committee. I've had discussions with the former chair, who is now the finance chair. And I have to tell you, um, I've been on this since my first day in office almost three years ago. And this formula just does not seem to bear any semblance to reality. And I hope that you will take that to heart. I'll be happy to show you the figures offline if you'd like. I don't want to take up too much of the committee's time on this. Um, I also want to ask you, in your testimony, um, you said that generally fair student funding makes up about two-thirds of the funding that every school gets per child. So some of my elementary schools, uh, I, I didn't get an updated list, but I know that it's fair to say, in being more generous than less generous, that some of my schools are in the, they're really below 6,000, but we'll use 6,000 as a benchmark for fair student funding. That's what they get per student. So that would indicate to me if that's two-thirds and the full amount of funding they get per student is about $9,000. I would like to know what happens to the rest of the money because it is often cited that we have, um, fortunately, the most well-funded schools in the United States of America. But if only $9,000 is getting into the hands of the principals to spend as they see fit, and I have excellent principals, um, it begs the question where the rest of this money is going. Now, I know some of it goes to build new schools, some of it goes to maintenance, some of it goes for busing, feeding, all those kind of things, heating and cooling. Um, but it seems that a not enough money, and this is something, I've, I've discussed this with the Chancellor privately, but I also wanted to bring it to your attention. And I, to me, it seems critical. I'm not an educator, but my wife is, and we have educators on this panel, including the chair and uh, Danny Drum. Um, how do we get more money into the hands of the principals who are actually on the front lines delivering the services? And the logistics seems to me to eat up an inordinate amount of money to get the job done. So I thank you for your advocacy and your support of our system. I, um, when we look at new programming across the department, and again, this administration has invested um, you know, $800 million cumulatively in the fair student funding formula over the last several years. Um, the priority in this administration for the fair student funding formula has been to raise the floor, which I know is a priority of this council as well, which we thank I, you. I greatly appreciate that, and I applaud the mayor for that, and I, I say it at every turn. I didn't say it at the beginning of remarks. I, I did mean to. But it really has to be an emphasis of the Department of Education to get more money in the hands of educators because those are the ones that are really delivering. It's kind of like the police force. If you want, there's a lot of bureaucracy there too, but it's the men and women of the police force who are on the front lines. We want more police officers on the street. We don't want more bureaucracy, and that has to be true. I want more teachers, I want more paras, I want more social workers, I want more guidance counselors, and those are the things, as my, my chairman will say, that's what fair student funding buys. And I was uh, just speaking to a principal yesterday, and Chair Traeger was kind enough to come out to my district, I think it was two weeks ago, to meet with um, the majority of my principals. Um, many of my smaller schools suffer also. They just, they have fixed costs that 
you know, the larger schools just can overcome in some way. Um, and so that's something that I think I would like to see added to the formula. You can please tell one of my, I won't tell you which one it was, but uh, <laughs> I said that. So um, something must be done, and I applaud uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and I applaud uh, the former chair and the Finance Committee chair for their efforts. And I know you're new, um, but we really need to continue to see more. We will go continue to lobby the governor and the legislature, um, but we need to see more movement in getting more money into the school system through fair student funding and through other means to put the money in the hands of those people who are actually educating our children. I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me for a little longer than I expected. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, Ms. Oates, Ms. Fasher. Thank, thank you, uh, Council Member. Uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Rodriguez. Uh, and just to quickly follow up on Council Member Gordentrick's comments, he was kind enough to invite me to a gathering of school leaders in his district as well. So it's, I'm not just hearing it at my end of the world in South Southern Brooklyn, I'm hearing it from other parts of the city that some, a good chunk of their FSF increases for those that received it were eaten up by cost of the rising average building salary. So this is not something that's just a Southern Brooklyn issue. This is apparently a citywide issue. And so I would really like for us to revisit this issue uh, to make sure schools are actually actualizing and seeing uh, a full increase in their, in their school budgets. And uh, just very quickly, um, very, what is the city's plan to raise the FSF for for all schools? And to follow up on that, the top 20 schools with the biggest gap uh, to reaching 100% of their FSF allocation are high schools. Yes. Can you explain why grade level weights are reduced in high school when compared to middle school? So again, the, the, you're referencing the largest schools in our system that have the greatest gap. Um, the reason why they have the greatest gap is because they have the most numbers of students. So with a per capita based funding system, the math works out that the largest schools who are not yet at 100% will have the greatest gap between where they are now and 100%. But the formula was created in kind of concert with enrollment of a school, is that correct? How many students per funding per student, is that right? Yes. So a school is actually being punished if they have more kids? No. Um, no, and they don't, as schools grow, they receive um, additional funding to support the schools, right. the students in their building. But why is it that the high schools are, the top 20 schools with the biggest gap are high schools? Can you explain that? <coughs> They're our largest schools. They have the greatest number of students in their, in their building, and a per capita based formula results in the greatest need in those schools, just surely because they are the largest schools. So, um, and so you acknowledge that creates a lot of problems for these high schools in terms of advancing students through ninth to 10th grades, making sure they're college and career ready, making sure that uh, their guidance counselors are not overwhelmed. These, these, some of these gaps, uh, there's a school in my district, a high school that has a million dollar gap and when I spoke to the principal about what, would, what can you do with a million dollars, he said it, it, it would be a game changer for a school. So, you know, this equity issue, we, it's, it's really a problem. Um, I mentioned him already. Oh, yes. oh I'm sorry. Uh, Councilman Rodriguez, you have to vote on Resolution 358. I'm sorry. Aye. Votes down at 15. Okay. And next, uh, Council Member Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for convening this hearing. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to ask about the relationship in uh, your thinking about fair student funding for Emila to a couple of other uh, initiatives I know that are taking place or that are being thought about in relationship to broader equity work and school integration work. Um, I know that I've heard the chance to speak on a couple of occasions about wanting to look at uh, issues of equity and funding in ways that I guess it's not clear to me whether he uh, means thinking about some changes to the fair student funding formula or thinking about some other ways of looking at schools uh, you know that have historic disinvestment or a lot of low-income or homeless kids that need 
um, additional investments from sort of an equity lens that might be different from fair student funding. So that's question one. And my question two is a little related. Um, in our work, our good work now, starting inching forward around looking at school integration, one challenge we face is Title I funding, which is federal funding targeted to increase resources for uh, schools with a lot of low-income kids. Um, you know, that, that's my understanding that the cutoff there is at 70%. Um, when our integration work works, uh, it will take schools in some cases so that instead of being 70% low-income kids, maybe it goes to 60%. Um, that's still a whole lot of low-income students, even if you're starting. To, and so to go from having all your Title I funding to none of your Title I funding instead of some maybe pro rata from 70% to 60% or something that would be more normal would be a lot better. But right now we've got this funding disincentive for schools to lean into diversity because they've got the challenges that pre-exist in fair student funding. They may not be all the way to their fair student funding for the somewhat more random reasons that you talked about. Um, there isn't yet a broader equity program and then they hit the Title I cliff. So I just, that's a lot to knit together, but I just wonder if you could talk about how as you're looking at this broader set of issues, you're thinking about it in relationship to our our equity and integration work and, and Title I specifically. Sure. Uh, so thank you for your support in District 15 and our um, diversity efforts. It's been exciting to see that work move forward. Um, as you know, that the Title I issue uh, really came out of that work and, and uh, some of the community's concerns around that topic. I can say that we've heard them. We absolutely understand that that is a concern. Um, we are looking into that issue, and it's certainly something that we will monitor closely. Uh, we are certainly um, not trying to create a financial disincentive for integration. Um, that said, Title I is a federally funded program, and just as a point of clarification, the threshold is 60% um, this year. Um, it's a federal program that comes with federal rules and regulations, and the um, grace period that you're referencing is actually set by federal law, and we don't have a lot of flexibility in that regard. Um, but it is something, th the issue that you describe is something that we are hearing from our school communities and something that we will certainly look out for as um, diversity efforts move forward throughout the city. Just to clarify on the federal, so thank you for that, and I know it's, you know, you've committed to look at it, and we have till, you know, next fall before yep the District 15 middle schools, uh, you know, will have a new census based on the, on the integration plan, so we've got a little window. But um, the, the, the sort of cliff, is, is, is the cliff mandated by, because, you know, obviously if you have 55% low-income students, you might merit less Title I funding than if you have 95% low-income students. So it's not a question of, but it, it would just be more rational a little bit like fair student funding to have something that accounted for that and wasn't, you got 100% of your fair student funding formula at 61% and zero of it at 59%. Is, um, is the cliff a, fed a, a federal mandate? Unfortunately, yes. There is a provision called grandfathering, which is the grace period that you're describing, and it allows for one year of continued Title I support. And after that, if the school does not reachieve Title I status, unfortunately, they permanently lose Title I status until such time that they might be able to um, regain it. So I guess it sounds like, at least in District 15, but obviously this will apply more broadly, that what we need to do is to kind of think about these things together so that if you have a school that, as a result of the federal, uh, that, that change loses all its Title I funding, and then just as it's getting, it's got about as many low-income students as it had, now it's got a much more heterogeneous group of learners, so it's got to be able to provide for a wider range of kids. We'll need some uh, offset of that cut, and whether that comes from something that's in fair student funding, or whether it comes from something that's in the integration work, or it comes from something that's in the ideas around equity that the chancellor's exploring. You're looking at this, these things, you're looking at them all together and, and will come to us or will come to the public with some proposals for addressing them uh, 
at some point, at least before next fall. My colleague, uh, Councilman Wender, I appreciate your support for our push for a poverty weight. That's exactly what we were talking about at the opening of this hearing, that right now the DOE only adds a weight for poverty up to the third grade uh, because they can't rely on test scores below the third grade. So, test, so poverty becomes almost like a proxy for the DOE. Uh, and as if poverty is an issue beyond the third grade. So there's no wait for students in temporary housing. Uh, so I, I think that this is definitely an opportunity for us uh, to work together. But I want to add another element that makes it difficult for schools to even reach the threshold. Because it's my understanding it's 60%, is that correct? In order to, to receive uh, the Title I funding. Um, many immigrant students and fa families are afraid to return the forms. And, and in addition, for good reasons, we're making it easier for everyone to get free lunch, and as a result, we have less information about their lunch eligibility. So I guess that's another question I was going to ask, just about what tools we're using to measure, to, you know, these issues in the in the world of transitioning to universal school lunch. This is this is an issue, especially in this hostile national climate towards immigrants. Uh, is is the DOE seeing lower and lower numbers of returns? in terms of the lunch forms to meet that threshold because that was a challenge when I was a teacher in my school. Uh, particularly immigrant families were very afraid of who would see this information and that was before the era of Trump. Now I'm sure it's, it's even, even more challenging. So can you speak to that? Just, and then, just to, I'll add, and then, just to extend then, the question, obviously yes. that's a good reason to enable people to have access to free lunch without Correct. Uh, qualifying, but it right. makes it more challenging for us to have good information on the demographics and income status of the students. So thank you for the, the question, and I appreciate the concern about this uh, population. I, I, our students, obviously, and their needs are at our, our, you know, our highest priorities. This, when we launched Universal Free Lunch uh, a few years ago, this, was, this issue that you're describing is absolutely at the top of our mind. We certainly didn't want to have the trade-off between Universal Free Lunch be at the consequence of our Title I allocation. And so under the leadership of First Deputy Chancellor um, Watson Harris and her field support centers, field service centers, we were able to actually do a tremendous amount of targeted outreach at the schools that actually resulted in collection of um, what are now called income eligibility forms um, at the schools this past school year. And so we, we knew that this, we anticipated this issue and we really put the manpower, woman power behind it. And um, we were able to collect those forms. Whether that behavior changes because of recent events, um, we, we, we hope not, but our teams will continue to push for those and advocate and try to really make sure that parents and families understand the relationship between that form and funding for their schools. Um, I just wonder on those, um, for, for families that are enrolled in one of the variety of social service programs that the city, you know, is aware of, uh, do you use or are you considering using any, um, with appropriate confidentiality, um, of that information so that, you know, in a lot of cases we've got students who are in one or another of HRA's programs. Um, this wouldn't necessarily get at the at immigrant students that are not, but it, you know, for those students who are enrolled in one of those programs, we could at least know that they are eligible for. Yes, so we do a direct match with all HRA programs and students, so if students or their families are eligible for food stamps or Medicaid or um, any sort of poverty assistance program, we do match that data directly as well as supplement that with the income eligibility forms. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for, for convening this, and I um, look forward as, you know, it's obviously a broader issue for the city, but as it relates specifically to the District 15 Middle School Plan, I uh, appreciate your helping open this up, and we look forward to working with you and with the DOE to make sure we come out with a, with a good approach. Thank you. I, I agree, Councilman Lander, and I think the FSF formula is, is due for some additional tweaking in light of the current uh, state of, of affairs, and also we should not be disincentivizing integration efforts either. I, I agree with you. Uh, we've also been joined by Councilmember King, uh, who uh, would also like to vote on Resolution 358. Councilmember King. I vote aye, and can you add me to the resolution as well? Well, it is now at 16. Uh, next for questions, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm going to uh, apologize. Despite my very high quality public school education, I definitely am not crystal clear on how this works. <laughs> um, 
the, the formula I is weighted so that if you have, if you have two, two elementary schools, both with 500 kids, one school's 100% number could very well be greater than another school's depending on the population. Correct. All right, I'm correct on that. So, but, but then why doesn't everybody get 92%? Because the formula is already weighting it, and then it seems like we're weighting it again. Like, who determines who gets 92% and who gets 90%? So, when the fair student funding formula was created about a 10 years ago, one of the guiding principles was not to cut any school budget. And that's a principle that um, guides our work today. Um, I'm not, I, I can't advocate for school budget cuts. And uh, I think uh, that continues to be a, an important priority for us. So, so in other words, but a school with, that, it, that it does not have a lot of need based on the weight could still be getting more money because historically they got more money? Like, I mean, doesn't that kind of... Our, so our data shows that the, the highest need schools receive the most money. Um, that's based on how the formula works now. Uh, the weights drive more money to the students with the greatest needs. Okay, and just the, the point that Chair Traeger was making, the gap. So in other, the gaps are, it's not only dollars, but it's percentage gap could be significantly different too. I mean, you know, if we all have an 8% gap, the fact that mine's a million and yours is, is 200,000 based on population size isn't as troubling as if the gap is, is, is you know, you have an 8% a, a gap and I have a 10% gap, that's more troubling. It, it just seems that there's really, that, you know, we're calling it a formula that, 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 there's, that there's a rationale behind it, but it seems in the end that there's, uh, you know, a mystery amount poured in that makes it very hard to, to rationalize what's happening here with the, with the formula. I, I, think I, do un I think I do understand. I'm not, uh, the, the report, by the way, it, that's available online. I don't think I've seen it. Yes, it is. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. And I encourage you to, to look at it, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, it's, there is, there are inequities in the system. And you know, as we mentioned earlier in this hearing, some schools, when this FSF started, started at 100%. Some schools didn't. Some schools remained at 100%, and some schools dipped, went up. It, it, it really, it's a roller coaster. But it does have a direct impact on your school. Um, I have a, uh, we've also been joined by council member Levin, who uh, would like to vote on Resolution 358. Thank you, Chair. Right. Council Member Levin. Vote aye. Opposed now at 17 in the affirmative. Uh, Ms. Oates, uh, in the uh, weights, K to 5, it's 1.00, which is 4,084 and 80 cents. Then we go to middle school from grades 6 to 8. It, it goes up to 1.08, which is $4,411.92. So I'll just pause here for a second and ask why the jump uh, from elementary to middle school? Uh, when the formula was created, the, the, the weight was increased for the six to eight population to reflect the greater than average academic and social emotional needs of our middle school population. Um, an administrative period for teachers and required library and guidance counselor services for middle school students. So, but you're, you're saying that there's social emotional need, needs of students. Guidance counselors are not even mandated in, el in elementary schools. Are you aware of that? And some schools have difficulty having a full-time guidance counselor even with these weights. Are, are, you, are you aware of that? I'm aware it's an issue we are discussing with you. Because when you give me the answer of social emotional needs and I know that we're not meeting them, I think it's an, it's an insufficient uh, response. Then we go from middle school, which we just mentioned is 1.08. We move now to high school, grades 9 to 12. It goes down 1.03 which is $4,206.95.
Can you explain why we go down from middle school to high school? Do the social emotional needs drop? The 9 to 12 weight reflects um, higher OTPS needs at those schools, smaller elective classes, more administrative personnel required generally at those schools, administrative period for teachers, required library and guidance services for high school students. Does, does the FSF high school base weight cover the cost of scheduling all high school students for four years with a full course load? Yes. Uh, the I, I should say the combination of all of the weights would mm -hmm. equal the instructional needs for those students, um, the classroom instructional needs. So if they're an L student, they would receive funding obviously under the L weight and special ed student and so forth. So not singly the grade weight, but the combination of the weights. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to just quickly ask a question also about uh, what we found with K, K, to, K to three. If, if the current poverty weight is intended to provide additional instructional supports for struggling students uh, kindergarten to third grade, why is the weight only 0.12 rather than the minimum 0.25 weight for struggling students in the fourth grade and above? So the, the weight that you're referencing um, is designed to provide supports to students, academic intervention supports to students in the early grades prior to testing. Um, and Laura can speak more eloquently than I can about how um, schools think about using this funding, but obviously we are prioritizing investing resources in this population, in this, in this group of students um, to ensure that by the time they reach testing age, they are, are ready for those tests and ready to succeed at those tests. So I would certainly say by fourth grade, when you have the third grade tests and the fourth grade tests and you see where students are at, the best indicator of success is one indicator is the success on tests. Certainly we believe that students are more than a test score and what teachers are seeing in the classroom, but by fourth grade you have a strong indicator of how students are doing. And so the weights apply to whether students are successful or struggling or other needs which are accounted for. Prior to the fourth grade, when you're not testing students, we know that poverty is an indicator of success, and we want to provide those additional supports since we don't have tests necessarily to measure those outcomes. We want to provide those supports to students earlier on. So, and just, yeah, uh, no, please, uh, please, so I was going to say, just to the larger budgeting question, principals make strategic decisions about where the needs are not just academic needs in terms of student test scores, but where their school wants to go. And that comes with a committee of people on a school leadership team making decisions about goals and then aligning the budget to that. And we think principals make those strategic decisions right there in that way and are able to get the things that they really need for schools. You know, we'll always advocate for more funds and with more we can do more but certainly they're making those strategic decisions to be able to decide what their priorities are, and they are a little different at every school. Dr. Fahey, why are we waiting until the fourth grade to find yeah. out how students are doing? Well, we know formatively how students are doing by classroom teachers, but we are looking at different indicators prior to students testing than we are when we have test scores for students that show signs of success. And so the weight's just uh, are directed at the information that we know from some of those things that we don't necessarily have um, specific test scores that we can compare across the system. I am not discounting formative assessment. I think that's an important way to know where students are every class, every week, every month. But certainly one test that you're giving across the board gives a lens of where all of our students are in a systemic way that is a better indicator of what supports it was my understanding, students. correct me if I'm wrong, that former Chancellor Farina focused very much on literacy in the second grade, is that correct? She did because third grade is a great predictor in a lot of research on how students will do. And so we have the data between third and fourth grade to be able to provide that in a different way after those tests than before. But yes, absolutely second grade is a targeted grade because we want to make sure kids are reading by the third grade. But I, I'm just pointing out that the weights somehow are are higher beyond 
they're, they're lower in, in, the, in the lower grades and higher, a little bit higher beyond fourth grade, and I think that we need to help build students up, yes, first grade, second grade, to help prepare them for, for, those, uh, for those exams. Uh, I think because there are indicators if a student is not being able to read a grade level in second or third grade, I, I am not sure of their chances of doing very well on those state assessments. Uh, that becomes a major challenge. Um, what efforts is the administration uh, taking to ensure the state fulfills this debt uh, to our city schools in terms of CFD? Uh, so, again, we're in tr we are, um, we've invested $800 million already in this formula. Um, some of that money does come from the state. When foundation aid um, that comes to us year over year exceeds other mandated costs. We haven't reinvested that funding in raising the floor. Our plan is to continue to do so. Um, and we appreciate your advocacy and your partnership as we go into the legislative season in Albany so that we can, you know, we can lobby for and hopefully secure additional foundation aid to invest into our school budgets. And may I just say also in response to the previous conversation that, um, you know, as a reminder, the fair student funding formula represents only two-thirds of a school's budget on average. There have been a variety of strategic investments that this administration has made. One of them is the Universal Literacy Program, which now provides um, reading coaches to nearly all schools, and it's targeted specifically at the K-12 grade band with the sole purpose of trying to increase their literacy so that they're prepared for their, their state um, tests. And, and life in general. And so I think there, you know, FSF looked at in isolation is not necessarily the best reflection of a school's budget. There are targeted investments that are made and schools that have um, received more school allocation memorandums are, are the ones that are targeted um, with all of our, you know, equity and excellence programs, but as well as those that receive other targeted investments. We've invested funds in guidance counselors at high needs schools. Um, we have invested in um, you know, expanding our physical education program. We've invested a lot of money in different areas that we believe are strategic investments. And when we prioritize those funds, we are certainly looking at the neediest schools. This chancellor has absolutely directed our office and everyone at DOE to look at the most underserved um, schools and their populations as we think about strategic allocations going forward. You mentioned some programs. How does the DOE determine whether funds should go to new programs such as AP for All or community schools as opposed to increasing the FSF percentage? So the community schools program is a great example of this. Um, our community school program, as you know, is provided largely by um, community-based organizations. Those are contracts with our community-based providers, and we don't want to burden our principals with having to deal with the specifics of the different contracts and making payments to those vendors. So our central office of community schools team does that work for them. And that funding, therefore, doesn't need to sit in a school budget or in an FSF budget. Um, the principal can focus on working with the community school coordinator and providing the best services and to their students. But how, how is it determined? How, do you, how, how does the DOE decide we want to invest in AP for all versus increasing the school's FSF percentage? So ideally, we're going to be able to do both. And in many years, we have done both. We have both raised the floor as well as invest in other programs with your advocacy. Um, that certainly continues to be our goal going forward. And again, as we look at all of our new initiatives, uh, you know, some, there are some programs where it does make sense. Um, you know, with the English language learner pro, uh, adjustment to those weights a couple of years ago is a really great example of, of uh, a change to the formula that really was needed and adding money to the formula for that purpose um, made sense. That was a $40 million investment that um, we thought was a, the right one to make in the formula to increase those weights to account for the required increase in instructional time. Something like air conditioners or the community schools program are things that some of our central or field teams can provide for schools and um, are better suited outside of the formula. Um. With community schools, the DOE also, as my understanding, provides 100% FSF, is that correct? Yes. Why is, was that decision made? Uh, when the renewal school program was created, many of, all of those schools, as you know, became community schools, and they benefited from the floor raise at that time. 
So you're acknowledging that when we invest what schools are owed, they should show improvements. Is that correct? I am hoping, as you are hoping, that all schools can reach 100% their student funding. Right. Because I want you to know that that was my uh, experience when I visited a school in Queens during, before my renewal school, community school hearing, where the principal used the added resources to hire additional social worker, which did make a significant impact in that school. Um, and so sometimes it's a school could be an art program, a guidance counselor away from reaching a turning point. But if a school is lacking a million dollars or even more in some cases, we are really, really holding them back. And I asked you before about the administration's efforts uh, to ensure that the state is fulfilling its uh, obligation to the city. I will share with you this, and I think Councilor Grudenchik, you joined, you were with us on our visit to Albany. I think, is it fair to say that I gave the governor somewhat of an education on FSF uh, and, a, and a school location memo? Uh, I think it's fair to say without getting into more details, yes. Um, <laughs> and we appreciate that. Um, I think that we need to do more to explain to our, our colleagues uh, in the state about the importance of FSF because when we advocate for more money, sometimes folks feel that we're speaking in the abstract, where is the money going? And that was one of the arguments we heard, where is the money going? Uh, thanks to uh, our great finance team here and, and, the, and the committee staff, Liz, Caitlin, and others, we prepared copies of school location memos to give them examples of how th these numbers are transparent. Uh, but, but I feel that we need to do more to explain to our colleagues what FSF is, how important it is. Um, because when I explain to some of assembly members and some state senators, uh, your school is owed a million dollars, or they had, you know, it really was eye-opening for them. Um, and I think it gives them a more targeted advocacy approach when, when they go fight for money. And clearly we have friends in the assembly majority. Uh, the Senate has been an issue and hopefully we'll see if that changes. And, um, uh, but I think you know, we made the case to the governor as well. I think we're gonna have to continue making that case. I, I am willing to be a continued partner in that effort. But the, the DOE also needs to make a commitment that as, if we see increases, hopefully we will, in our school budgets, that money continues to go towards FSF to continue to raise the floor so we see schools reach 100%. Uh, do we have that commitment? You absolutely have my commitment that we will work together in the upcoming months with, um, you know, in our legislative push in Albany to try to secure additional foundation aid. We certainly appreciate your advocacy and we're glad that our um, fiscal transparency efforts have enabled you to be better advocates for us. We are excited about the report. I, I brought it along. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity to provide what you just described, which is to really put a name to what the, the gap is for individual students. and. Um, we look forward to working with you. Uh, thank you. And last question, Ms. So it's the, and I think my colleague has uh, a, a final question too. Um, on the legislation, uh, on the task force bill, um, just to be clear, does the administration support the bill, not support the bill? I just, I think we need some further clarity. So you used the word dialogue in your testimony, which I appreciated. I think that is the right word to describe um, the conversations that need to happen uh, about the fair student funding formula. We support the spirit of the, the dialogue and the, and the conversation. Um, we, do, we do hope that folks recognize the significant engagement efforts um, that we do um, now, as well as the panel's role in voting on the weights every year. And, um, and their necessary role in this process. So I think you know, we can commit to certainly continuing that dialogue as you have heard and anyone who listens to the chancellor has heard. Um, he is very concerned about our underserved students and populations and this is definitely something where we will have more to say uh, about in the future. Right, because 
what, what I also heard in the beginning of this hearing is that there was kind of a lack of clarity about who was originally involved in the process to design the original formula. Uh, you mentioned there were folks internally. I don't know who they are. Uh, and I, I, and I, I respect the role in, of CECs, and, but I, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear educators. I didn't hear critical stakeholders who are on the ground in, in the schools uh, who are involved in this process and, cr and, and some critical organizations that could be very helpful. Um, and so that's, that's the spirit behind the legislation, to actually involve people beyond Tweed Mm -hmm. uh, to have a very hands-on look at the formula, to figure out how we got there, and to figure out tweaks and recommendations back to the chancellor, back to the DOE, because that will help us provide healthy dialogue once we hear from critical stakeholders about what would they do different, how can we better meet the, meet the needs of our students. Because as you already acknowledge in one exchange, the issue with poverty is, is, needs to be addressed. And that's an area that I, you know, and I, I wanna thank the advocates and, and, our, and our amazing uh, teachers and principals and, and organizations that have really been at the forefront of dealing with this issue who have consistently said we need to do more to better address the needs of our students. So I, I, I look forward uh, to advancing this legislation in cooperation with the DOE and, and with stakeholders. Uh, to have a robust conversation and dialogue uh, about how to better meet the needs of New York City students. And uh, so my colleague, Councilmember Grudenchik, you will have a, the final question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here today and everybody else. I, I was going to um, request what the chair requested, and I'm just going to echo his remarks now, um, that if we are successful in lobbying in Albany, that these funds be dedicated in large measure. I know that the department has a lot of needs, but in my, my many visits to schools, um, the biggest need is in the classroom and, and to get more money into the hands of the principals so they can get more money into the hands of the other educators and professionals in the building. And I, I do want to, um, the chair touched on this earlier, I do want to also ask that the formula take into account um, the impact that veteran teachers can have on a school's budget because my schools are in Eastern Queens. Um, many educators, I have uh, approximately 3,600 educators, teachers living in my district according to the good people at the UFT. Uh, I also live very, my, my district, uh, the eastern border is Nassau County, so many people live in Nassau as is their right to do so. Um, so they like to work in Eastern Queens, and um, they like to get to my schools, and I have great educators, but it also skews uh, what is available to the principals for their spending, and I hear this over and over and over. Every time I visit a school, which is several times a week, this is what we hear from our principals. So I would hope that that could be taken into account somehow um, because it does impact on what they're able to do. You have a veteran educator, costs a lot more than somebody right out of college. So uh, I thank you for listening to me today. I'm not going to ask any more questions. And I also want to thank the chair for um, this very timely um, hearing as uh, we get ready to go back to Albany to fight for more money for school aid. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Grudenchik. Uh, our amazing staff actually found a uh, copy of the Fair Student Funding Guide that was produced, was it back in 07 or 08? Um, and it actually, because I asked before about people that were involved in the process of formulating the, the original formula. And I'll read you the names of the people that the DOE consulted with. Now again, this was before the de Blasio administration, so to be clear, but these were the folks that the DOE consulted with. Arlene Ackerman, former superintendent, San Francisco, Seattle, and Washington. Chester Finn, President of the Thomas Fordham Foundation, Hoover Institution. William uh, Uchi, professor at UCLA. John Podesta, former White House Chief of Staff to President Clinton. Marguerite Rosa, professor, University of Washington. And Michael Strombinsky, former superintendent from Edmonton, Canada. Now, I am sure that they are very, very well uh, you know, distinguished in their, in their 
professions. I didn't see anyone from New York City. I didn't see any critical organization in New York City, any uh, educators from New York City. Um, this really drives home the point I made earlier. We need to involve voices here on the ground. People that live through this every single day have to be at the table. Uh, and in the Sosa, again, I congratulate you on your new, uh, new role, new position. I look forward to working together, and, and as well as to Dr. Fehu as well. And thank I, you. And I thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. First panel, I'd like to call up Mark Canazero, president of CSA, and Sarita Subramanian from New York City Independent Budget Office. I'm going to defer to my colleague here first. And forgive me if I didn't pronounce your name, name correctly. Subramanian. Subramanian. Thank with you. The mic on. Oh, I'm sorry. Subramanian, correct. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Traeger and members of the City Council. My, num my name is Sarita Subramanian, and I'm the supervising analyst for the education team at the New York City Independent Budget Office. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at this oversight hearing on fair student funding and the proposed reso on amending the formula to incorporate a weight for students in poverty in fourth grade or higher. I've prepared a brief remarks, um, but please refer to my longer testimony for more detail. In my testimony, I will first discuss an analysis that IBO published last week describing the shortfall to individual schools' FSF budgets over the past five years. Then I will discuss some of the benefits that would result from the enactment of the RESO, but also highlight a few concerns and some suggestions for additional items to consider. A report mentioned the $125 million that the mayor and speaker agreed to add to the Department of Education budget to raise the floor to 90% for the 2018-2019 school year. It is important to note, however, that the $125 million includes funds for pension and fringe costs, which are typically not included in FSF allocations and not reflected in individual schools' budgets. Because our analysis was focused on the school level, the amounts that we reported are more closely aligned with what appears on individual schools' budgets. Roughly $78 million of the funds announced last spring would be reflected in schools' budgets. IBO's analysis of schools, budget, schools' budgets showed that the additional funding needed to fully fund the formula has been declining in each of the past five years. Focusing on last school year, we found that roughly 1,200 schools were underfunded. Many schools had a shortfall of $500,000 or less, while roughly 280 schools each had a shortfall that exceeded $500,000. 63 of those schools had shortfalls of $1 million or more. Given that 78% of schools remain underfunded 10 years after FSF was first implemented and increased funding from the state still has not materialized, the city's efforts to continue raising the floor for all schools are critical. The RESO calls for additional funding for schools that serve students in fourth grade or higher by incorporating a poverty weight over and above the existing need weights. If the RESO had been in place last year, it would have brought additional funding for all or a portion of students in poverty to almost all schools. However, 36 schools would have received no additional funding because they did not serve any students in grade four or above. There would probably need to be some additional consideration for students in poverty in those 36 schools. 
Moreover, if the proposed changes are intended to be cost neutral, that would mean some other weights would need to be adjusted down in some way. The RESO also calls on the Department of Education to automatically classify all students in temporary housing as in poverty. IBO looked at the more than 103,000 students in the 2016-2017 school year classified as in temporary housing and found that virtually all of them were already identified as in poverty in our data. A more direct way of providing additional funds to schools that serve students in temporary housing would be to add a separate weight in the formula, similar to the weights that currently exist for students with disabilities and English language learners. In that case, either more money would be needed to dedicate it, would be needed to be dedicated to FSF, or a portion of existing funding in the central DOE budget could instead be distributed directly to schools through a revised FSF formula. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger, Council Member Drum. Um, first of all, I'd like to start just by thanking the council for working with us consistently, as well as the mayor for last year raising the uh, fair student funding by 125 or 78 million um, dollars uh, to, for additional funding for schools. Um, I've heard a lot of discussion about the fair student funding formula the last few moments, and it's absolutely true that the fair student funding formula needs tweaks. It is true that the average teacher salary uh, is a problem, and it is also true that at one time schools were charged the average teacher's salary for New York City, not for their school. Um, another problem with the formula is, is empty seats. Some schools, uh, just by the nature, have what we call breakage, maybe 40 kids in a particular grade where there's going to be 20 in each class, um, which results in less students needed to fund the actual teacher and, and, and the class. Um, some things I heard also were the fact that approximately on average two-thirds of a budget is fair student funding. Um, many of the schools with the biggest issues are schools where more than two-thirds of their school budget is fair student funding and they are below 100% uh, fair student funding. I also heard discussion regarding strategic decisions being made by principals. If there is no money, there are no decisions to be made and that's period and that's a fact. Um, I, I really appreciated Council Member Cohen's question uh, asking about budgets being cut. Budgets were cut. Um, there was a time when all schools were at or very close to 100% um, and budgets were cut. They called them peg adjustments at the time. However, my testimony right now, although I think the, the formula is important and, and needs to be worked on, right now the point is not even that. Right now the point is the fact that Schools are being treated disparately. Again, to, to Council Members Cohen's point, we have schools that for the last 10 years have been underfunded according to the fair student funding formula. Every new school that was created was created at 100%. But yet, schools that have been underfunded for years continue to be. And that was a fine, that was a fine discussion to have 10 years ago where we said, okay, what we'll do is raise the floor consistently to get everybody to 100 rather than disrupt budgets that are already at 100 percent. That was, that, that made a lot of sense, but there is no reason that 10 years later we are still where um, we are. We're applying a formula that is designed for equity, and you heard testimony that the formula is designed to drive dollars where they're needed most, and that's great. But when you give me a formula to drive dollars needed where it's needed most and I have high needs, and then you tell me I'm receiving 90% of those dollars, they're no longer being driven to where they're needed the most. Now, we will continue to lobby in Albany, and we will fight for our fair treatment under the Campaign for Fiscal Equity formula. In fact, that has been something we have been pushing very hard for. However, it's time now that whether we get that funding or not, and chances are we'll get some of it, that whether we get that funding or not, we do something to bring our schools to 100%. Um, and, and if you've ever spoken, and I'm sure you have, uh, Council Member Traeger, Chair Traeger, to principals who have been in budget appeals all summer long, only to get their final budget the first week of school, you will understand how our children are being shortchanged, not just economically, but with the amount of time and attention that is being placed to their educations because principals are spending the entire summer fighting for their budget rather than planning for a school year so that kids can benefit most. 
I finally, I would like to thank you and the council members for taking a resolution on early childhood pay parity. Um, that is absolutely critical. Our members have been providing a quality education and showing up every day enthusiastic and motivated and giving our youngest children a chance they would not otherwise have had in life. But yet they are being paid at a very, very disparate and, and disproportionately sad level of, of, um, of compensation. Those folks need to be made whole and that needs to happen right away. Thank you and I'll take any questions you have. So Mr. Canizaro, so you mentioned before and I appreciate bo both of your powerful testimony. Uh, mentioned before that you are, in fact, hearing from school leaders uh, that uh, the current system almost punishes hiring veteran teachers because I, what I've heard from principals is the FSF increase was wiped away because of the average building salary increase. My former school is a, is a perfect example of that. My school, um, generally the average teacher salary in my school was about $10,000 above the citywide average. I had 85 teachers, which had I been at the citywide average would have given me $850,000 per year in additional spending authority. Um, as a result of having to fund those teachers um, at, their, at the average teacher salary in my school, um, that, that put me in quite a deficit so that I was in a budget appeal year after year. And while there may be something to be said for the fact that additional resources are needed for a school that has many early career teachers, this formula overcompensates for that and, and is, puts people in large schools with large numbers of teachers that, are, that are, have teaching, average teacher salary above the average at a tremendous disadvantage. That's what I've heard across the board. Mm -hmm. And it, it almost as if it, it has this sinister design where you're pitting newer teachers versus veteran teachers. And it, this reminds me of, of the fight during the Bloomberg years, and it, it's something that we should be eradicating uh, today. Uh, and, you know, and I applaud, and I you know we've been joined uh, by President Mulgrew, and, and thanks to the uh, excellent and powerful advocacy of the UFT, teacher salaries are going up. And so that means the average salary of the building continues to go up. And I, I heard from folks who have good knowledge of the history of the DOE that they, they used to account for the citywide average. Do you know how far back uh, that went? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture a guess and say it was around 2010 or 11 when they went to the average teacher salary in your actual school, maybe not, you give or take a year. And did you, any reason why they shifted? That you well, I, I think the, the testimony you heard earlier was, was the, the philosophy behind that, that earlier career teachers needed additional professional development, so this would drive funds to the early career teachers where the later career teachers may not have needed as much professional development. I've made the recommendation that for schools with a large number of early career teachers that, that, that there is an allocation for professional development. but. The allocation, again, in a small school um, where there might be a few, st a few early career teachers driving dollars for professional development, that may work. But a larger school where you have a large number of teachers below the formula is one issue, and then you look at the, the school next door with similar needs, but a large number of teachers well above the average teacher's salary, um, those, folks, those folks get penalized. And Final question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, with regards to the October register month, because you see, I know the inside baseball, and so no one could try to fool me on this issue. But there are some folks in the DOE are saying that this is no longer really an issue. But again, I speak to people on the ground. I don't live in a bubble here at City Hall. And so can you share with me whether this remains an issue today where students enter a school building after the register month, some of them might have additional needs than others, but they are not funded for. Yes, it, it's, it's an issue in many schools, not all, but in, in many, many schools. And the issue goes both ways. Not only do students enter a, a, a particular school after the 31st and they're not budgeted for it, Quite often, the Department of Education tells a principal that they must plan for certain classes 
and they must fund those classes that don't materialize in September. Come October 31st, they're charged for the children that they never received, and the principal didn't predict those children coming. Coming, They were told by the Department of Education that these children in protect often a special needs class or an English language learner or bilingual class never materializes, yet the principal was told it was going to. They hired appropriate staff, and then come October 31st, they lose money from their register because those children never arrive. So it, it cuts both ways. It, it, it's schools receiving children after the 31st that they're not paid for, and schools having to pay for classes that never materialize. It happens both in both ways. And what I envision in my mind is, again, in our public schools, we welcome all. We welcome all. We, when parents and families come with their children, we, we welcome them, we give them a C in a classroom. We don't give them a ping pong ball like others. But the issue is, is that if they come to the school with particular needs, and that school is facing a significant gap in their FSF, as I mentioned before, some schools are maybe two guidance counselors or a paraprofessional or a social worker or an art program away from reaching a turning point. That's what hurts me is that we have kids in our school system that we know have certain needs that we cannot fund that mandate. Mm -hmm. And are you continuing to hear these cases in our schools? Absolutely, and, and to, to, to even take it a step further, schools that are fighting for budget appeals are often fighting for budget appeals just to put a teacher in front of a mandated classroom, Correct. let alone an additional art program or guidance counselor, things that are certainly needed and critical for, ch for children's development. So, so we just need to put a little more common sense around this, this whole idea of budgeting. Uh, thank you uh, very much. And one quick question for the IBO. Uh, what number does the IBO have in terms of getting all schools to 100% FSF? Sure. Uh, so as of um, last year, uh, that was $491 million. Uh, for the 2017-18 school year. And is that including pension? No, that, that is not including pension. That's just that's based on what's in school budget. probably a lot, a lot bigger. Yeah. But At about 40%. Yes. Or 61. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. Look, look if, it, yeah, right. if the state just paid its bill in the first place, we wouldn't even have, have this issue. Right. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, President uh, Michael Moguru of, of the UFT, and also just uh, as well as to congratulate you Mr. President, a very powerful uh, contract that really lifts up the lives of educators. Well, we'll thank, welcome you here. Thank you very much, and I want to thank you as the chair, and of course, uh, Mr. Drum, uh, so much for all of your work on education, and I thank you for having this hearing. I've heard a lot of the frustration. Um, this is something that has to get changed. The common sense approach is gone. I was here when we started this budgeting process the first time. It was a previous mayor who did it, and he said basically he wanted to treat every school as if it was a fast food restaurant. And that's how he was going to let every decision be made at the school, and whether they, if they were successful or not was, didn't matter. It was He would hold them accountable, but every school would be doing things this way. The average teacher salary was a big thing. That's when we moved from what was known as the units into the average teacher salary. Um, to have a system that, and I've heard the arguments from the Department of Ed and from the city, uh, and from City Hall, that this is a better way of equity. If we're truly trying to get equity, let's first and foremost make sure that every child is receiving the basic services that the system is required to do. Yet, there is a great reluctance on their behalf to move to that type of system. The fact that you're putting all of this, uh, 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 there's a known entity in every school we know how many children are going to be in the building. We know it plus and minus, but you know those children are going to be there. So you'll know how many classes you're going to need, even if they're full, how many classes you're going to need. You're going to, you're going to know how many support services they need because those are mandated. These are all finite things that can be figured out ahead of time. The fact that we go through this ridiculous process every year, what then it's, oh, here's a bucket of money we did on a formula that you're never going to figure out, but you have to figure out how to make sure all those services are being provided. That is a known quality, a quantity that the Department of Ed should be supplying the school before the school year starts. 
Does anyone think we have 1,800 budgeting experts as principals of New York City? Of course not. It makes no sense. And I believe it is an abdication of responsibility on the Department of Ed as because they do not want to take that work on. They say it's principal's autonomy. I've said, I'm sure the principal would like a sheet saying, oh, these are all the services, the minimum services I know I have to have in place, thank you. But yet, this has been like banging your head against the wall when we have these discussions. And in terms of the average teacher's salary, as I said, it was an idea that came out of the previous mayor and those who were like-minded in terms of educational philosophies with him. None of them use this anymore. Michelle Ree was the last one to use it. She says it doesn't work. Yet the largest school system in the country is continuing to use an idea that wasn't even theirs, that was some really bad people who didn't like public education, it was their idea, and yet we're the people who keep using it. And it needs to change. And it's difficult when we're trying to figure out the different formulas. We know from, student, uh, from looking at growth measures in terms of student learning, there are, you need to have a knowledgeable group of experts looking at this. If you change one weight, and we started doing this at the state level with growth formulas, you would change one weight on one variable and then have an adverse effect, um, effect on three different other variables that you weren't counting on. So there really has to be a knowledgeable group who sits and looks at these things, not psychometricians who don't understand that in the end, these effects are on children, not on the actual numbers. So that common sense approach to budgeting in terms of what are the weights that we're looking at, that is something we would love to work on with the Department of Education and with the city of New York. I will never support and I will fight forever against using the average teacher salary in a school. It's, it's an insane, asinine approach to school budgeting. Yet, the employer seems not to be willing to stop being asinine on this issue. And the last piece is, I think there is a responsibility on all the adults to say to the school system, at the beginning of every school year, we know you have the staffing that is needed, the basic minimum staffing, and that's what we call this, basic minimum staffing that is needed to make sure that every child is receiving the services that are mandated for them to use. And once that is put in place, then there is autonomy with a budget. It would take a lot of work out of this in terms of principals now would have an understanding of what they're doing, People don't want to be frustrated when they're struggling to try to figure out their budget. I walk into schools, a lot of schools, and the principal's like, I'm out of compliance, and, I, and they're telling me I have no money, and I can't hire the person I need to hire to get into compliance. And it's just insane. So, but we look forward. As always, this is a tough issue. Um, and as my counterpart said, we will continue to go to Albany. We will continue to advocate and lobby on behalf of the school children of New York City and the school communities, but at the same time, we are going to focus more and more now on lobbying on this issue because we're the people who do the majority of the lobbying, us and the parents. The two unions and the parents do most of the lobbying on behalf of the New York City school system, and we want a better system in terms of making sure that all children are getting the services and the education they deserve. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, President Mulgrew. Well, uh, it's called drop the mic, I guess, yeah. right? Uh, I asked the DOE earlier about who they involved in the process when they originally came up with fair student funding. Uh, this was back in 2007, 2008, so this was before the current administration. Uh, we didn't get much clarity other than hearing that there were internal conversations and deliberations within DOE it was a group of deputy chancellors who no longer work for the city of New York. Uh, and according to a guy that we found, that our great council found, uh, they also consulted with some great mm -hmm. professors from the West Coast, Canada, and John Podesta, the former chief of staff in the White House. Yep. Uh, so I really didn't see or hear about educators, folks on the ground, stakeholders here in New York City, that understand the New York City school system that came up with this formula. They were unabashed about saying they wanted to run every school as if it was a retail store. They were very proud of that point. So 
we need to have a common understanding that this was a formula uh, formed under a administration that really did not believe in public education. Mm -hmm. And I know that there has been some subtle tweaks since then, but for example, just to share with you, President Mober, I'm sure others have heard in testimony, the issue of poverty. Uh, poverty is only accounted for up to the third grade. Uh, it, it acts in, in a way as a, as, a, as a proxy because there are no test scores below the third grade which they, they can rely on. It's almost as if, if you're in the fourth or fifth grade, poverty doesn't exist anymore. Um, and we read reports that there's an increasing number of students in temporary housing, mm -hmm. and these students are highly mobile. If they move to a different uh, shelter or a different location, uh, then th that need travels with them, but the funding does not. As we've heard before, past October, that's it. And you know, I know the DOE sometimes has their own version of this, but again, I speak to folks on the ground, in addition to the great unions that we have, you know, I regularly check in with schools, not just in my district, but I've been to schools across the boroughs, and I hear the same thing over and over again. They don't have the funds to meet mandated services. And also, I'd like to add that the DOE has this, you know, I think this, this poor practice of saying that only children with IEPs have needs. Well, I, first of all, I still think we're, we're failing their needs to meet their needs, but th there are students without IEPs who still have needs. And we failed, there are students who experience trauma in, in different forms. Um, so this is, you know, and, and, and just to hear that really educators were not involved in this original process is very disturbing. And one of the bills I have is to create a, a task force, a group of involving city educators critical stakeholders to look at the formula now and to come up with recommendations uh, to the chancellor, to the council, uh, and to the mayor on what uh, tweaks, what changes should be made to the formula to make it more equitable and fair. I just want to hear, hear your thoughts on I, that. I think it goes much further than that. I, I, I'm going to go keep going back to this. It doesn't matter to a child who needs a service what the formula says. We have a responsibility as a school system to make sure that child is getting their service. And what are you supposed to say to them and their family? Oh, I'm sorry, the formula didn't work out for you this year. We don't have the money to hire the staff to do the service that you, require, you need. That's insane. And, and, and just as you were speaking about poverty is only accounted for such a... Let's just get the basics in place and guarantee that first. We have hundreds, if not thousands, of complaints about noncompliance a year. They go to the city, they go to the state, they're all over the place. Principals are stuck in the middle, being left in a situation now, no matter what they do, they can't make the educational decision they want to make. So at first, Formula is one piece, but we have to put in the minimum that is we know a school community needs in each workplace. And to say that, what, to, for the Department of Ed to say to us, well, the principal made the decision, that's, that's absurd. And they're just passing the buck and they know exactly what they're doing. We should have at least the assurance that every one of the basic services required are put in place. Period. End of story. And that should not be left up to everybody at the schools to figure it out. The Department of Ed should be able to, it's a known quantity, Department of Ed should run that report, make sure that that minimum is in place, and then we can talk about formulas. But at least let's get that right first. And it's, it's my understanding that there is a base amount provided to every single public school. Is that correct? Well, that's the $250,000. Right, right. I'm just, I'm just saying, but that's not even accounting for any needs of that school, any mandated service. It's just a blind amount. Is that right? Yes. Did you ask the Department of Ed the question that if the school is 100 percent funded, is there a possibility that they won't be able to afford all of the services for the building? Well, we found many, we found examples where school is short over a million dollars, or in some cases the gap is over mi millions of dollars. Um, and I know very well that these schools are having difficulty meeting their needs. So uh, I, I would argue that it's my, even, even with current shortfalls, 
it would be hard to meet all the mandated services at this point. What, what, what Mr. Mulgrew spoke about a moment ago, you and I have had this conversation, I've had this conversation with the Department of Ed, we've written about it, we've, we've jumped up and down and, and, and tried to scream about the obviousness of it. If you have mandated needs for a school, everyone knows there's gonna be a child in front, a teacher in front of every class. Everyone knows that based on a certain number of students or classes, you need assistant principals, guidance counselors, social workers, school aides, school secretaries, deans in middle schools and high schools. Everyone knows that those needs are there. Fund them first at no charge to schools and then talk about a formula for needs beyond that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, some of my colleagues have questions. Council Member Rodriguez. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. And here we are, three educators. Gentlemen here with more seniority, I think that, than I have, but I did 13 years in the classroom before being elected to office. And co-chair of two, I mean, co-founder of two schools, Luperon High School and Washington Heights Health Academy, the community school that you visited there. For me, it break my heart how we are living in a city where we have the most segregated educational system in the whole nation. And that's happening under our watch. It, and it's not only about, are the students ready to read, do science and math at the level when they go to middle school? By the resources of a school, depending on the seat code that we have. How the DOE in this formula is not taking into consideration a school that because most of the students, they are middle class and they can raise half a million dollars. And when the DOE say you have to cut the budget, especially art and music, sport are the first thing cut. There's some schools that they're poor, serving the underserved community as the one that I served that principal had to deal with the cut. But here we have the other schools where the parent they're able to raise the $300,000, half a million dollars. So how this formula is leaving behind that reality to look at, you know, the capacity of schools to raise more funding than other, and what is the, the city doing to say, if we have a number, so what percent of the school have PTA that they, are, they cannot raise a, a dollar? And we know how important the difference that you make in the formula that we need to put in place. That's the additional one. Like, how are we letting those reality happen in our time? And most important thing for me is thinking about the formula, and, and, and I think it is important to especially look at poverty, you know, as, as an important factor on how we distribute the funding and how even today that's not happening in our city. When you look about our budget, 25 or $26 billion, like what percentage of that money? Because for me, the lack of resources that we have in our schools for principals and teachers is not only the lack of funding that we have at the DOE, is also how we use, the, how we spend the money. What percent of that money is used directly for principal and teachers? And what percent is this you for central office? Yeah, well, well there's, 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 no, there's no right answer to that question because it's different in every school based on salaries of folks and the percentage of funding and, and so on and so forth. And then there's an additional piece to that that makes things even more challenging. Some schools qualify for Title I dollars that they can drive to their students in poverty. And some schools have a significant number of students in poverty, as Councilmember Lander was discussing earlier, and they don't have Title I funding to drive to those students. So that's a, a complicated answer to what should be a simple question. Um, the fact of the matter is the needs, and, and Michael testified to this a moment ago, if a child has a need, we need to be able to provide that need. Um, as far as percentages and things, I, I think you'd have to get that information from the Department of Education, because I don't have the answer unless the IBO may have some, some help there. I don't know. It's, 
there's been numerous audits done over the years by the controller's office. It's the shifting of personnel to school budgets versus they'll shift them back to central budgets. It depends on what people are looking at. Uh, I, look, this budgeting piece is, has been something that is one of the things that were left over from the last administration. Uh, we know numbers are games at times, but in the end, this is children, so this is not a game we should be playing. I am happy that our school system is moving forward, but I think it's going, it needs to solve this piece. That's why it's appropriate to be having this conversation right now. Uh, what is the amount of central spending? What, what's the real number? Oh, are we going to play, oh, if we're looking at central spending, then shift all the personnel to the school budgets, and therefore central spending just went down. And did it really go down? Probably not. But then if you want to look at, you know, this is, these are the games that are played. So if you're going to have a safe space where people will actually engage in a conversation about what's the best way to budget for the schools and also budget for the support services that we know our school system needs, that's a conversation we're willing to have. That is not a subject of collective bargaining. It's been ruled out, which is why we now push for minimum staffing requirements. Uh, that is something we have been pushing at very uh, aggressively. But Overall, look, this is New York City. We know the politics around everything. But I think if we could create a space where people could actually have a real conversation about what would be a better system for funding both the schools and the support services that schools need, I think that would be worthwhile. Because this is what I do know. When a system is set up and they have all the little computer systems ready to go, the bureaucracies don't like to change. I, I, I just think that. Like to change. I, I just think that again, I hope at some point we working with you guys, you know, who represent the the principals and the teacher who being assigned responsible to take to certain level of students without all the resources that they need. Like for me this is about like which is the generation that will have like an open conversation saying, you know, it cannot be that a principal who worked with a student in high school, when they got a student that they were reading, writing, and doing math in fifth grade level, that they are the new coming, that they are taking the student over the country, that the DOE is not adding additional funding after a certain period of time. When are we looking at those pieces to say, you know, unless those resources are added there, 10, 40, 60 years from now, we will be creating the same system that we have here. Leaving a student behind, not because of lack of leadership, but yet because we live in the city of the two tail. Well, if you have a student in the middle class community, the so sports is part. Those of us, anyone that is raising children, you know that your child is in a good competitive sport program. After school program, we know that that's key. It, 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 a special additional resources, psychology, guiding counselor, all those programs is that will make the difference. What resor additional resources? Why in the formula, on the Title I and all the investment, we don't say it should be, it's a mandatory that the school, a, a school should have the funding to provide mandatory after school program to elementary school. That's what real, I used to be high school. My wife used to be elementary, she just told me. Forget about high school. Real teaching happened when you work from the pre-K to the fifth grade. And here we have many schools that in the way of how we distribute the Title I and all the funding, unfortunately, we are not providing enough resources, and we need to fight together to be sure that every single community get the same resources. And poverty should be one of the important factors to decide how we distribute the funding here. And we need to stop prioritizing most of the funding to central office and reassigning people to other places. Most of the funding should be directly to the school. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Lander. Thank you very much, Chair Traeger. Um, I do want to get your take. I mean, you've been getting at this, and, and I got up here a little late, so maybe it was in your testimony to, be, to begin with, but to just kind of take a step back, and you know, obviously we have these two quite different approaches that each have their merits. 
putting resources through some formula in the hand of a principal that can build a strong stool community and work with folks in their building to do it has merit. On the other hand, we want every school to have a guidance counselor and we want every school to have PE and like, you know, so the, you know, the version of public education I grew up in, it was clear what a school was gonna have. You had a set of classrooms, every one of those classrooms had a teacher, you had a nurse, you had a guidance counselor and uh, you know, they all were wherever they were on the salary formula. Um, so you wound up with a budget built by functions rather than by formula in students. And right. you know, each approach has strengths and weaknesses. And then you wind up trying to blend them because you got the formula, but then you don't have guidance counselors. So then we say we want more guidance counselors. And then, so I mean, I, you know, I, don't, I think that's where we are. And we're going to try to push harder to make everybody up at 100% and to adjust for some factors uh, like poverty and some of the things where the Title I cliff and things we're talking about. But I, I just I thought it might be useful to get your perspective on just the general approach of school budgeting and what, you know, what has been gained in the transition from that more functional approach, what has been lost, and what that teaches us for moving forward. Thank you. And, and, um, I, I love that question, actually, and, and it's a hybrid approach that I think is, is the best approach, and, and there has been a lot learned from this fair student funding formula, and, um, and, and I think the first thing is to, to the point that both Michael and I were making. When you have a school of a certain size, you know how many teachers you're going to need at a minimum. You should be able to come up with a formula based on the students and or the classes because special needs schools have fewer students but more classes. So you should, need to be, you should be able to come up with a formula for all your support services in addition. So how many, what's the minimum number of guidance counselors you should have for this population, the minimum number of deans, for example, school secretaries, school aides, paraprofessionals, um, all, all, of these, all of these needs should be there. And it, once you come up with th those needs and you submit them, as, as Michael testified to, on a sheet of paper and say, here they are, and here's the dollars for them, there can, be, there can still be some discussion at the school level, school leadership teams to say, you know what, this particular school might not need four deans. Maybe we need two and we're gonna use those resources differently. At least that speaks to all of the rhetoric we hear about decisions that made at the school level to keep certain people and to, and to, um, you know, to hire additional uh, other titles. Right, so, so then somebody can stand up and say, yes, I'm accountable for that decision because myself and my team made that decision for this reason. Once that piece of the formula is put aside, then by all means develop some type of fair student funding formula that will drive additional dollars to the school to be spent discretionarily, discretionarily for other needs of the school to be used for children in poverty that might need either a smaller class size or academic intervention services of a, of a different kind or to use for after school programs that are needed and, and all of the other programs that may be needed. But none of that can or should happen until every school knows from day one until the end of the year and planning for the following year that every one of their required staff members are going to be there. No one should go into the summer saying, I don't have a third grade teacher because I can't afford one and I have to put an appeal in for that. That should never happen. So again, if you take all your needs, you fund your needs, let people make decisions even within that, but then go to a formula that's needs-based, needs, needs based, I think we're going, that'll, that'll bring you up to the, to the best of, of both worlds. The, the hybrid approach is an appropriate uh, way to go. Um, following up on everything he just said, this way you have the ability for a school to customize its own educational program based off of their judgment of what the needs of their students are. And at the same time, we as a city can feel comfortable knowing that every child is receiving this, the services that we know that they need. So that clearly is the way to go. And as well as just basic common sense that you also take a lot of ridiculous amount of work. Just imagine what goes on to a school when they're trying to figure out what they actually need when the Department of Ed should just be sending it to them. 
I mean, a principal has to get all of this stuff broken down, figure it all out. Do, I mean, just send it to them and tell them what they need. Uh, you know, and then you, school communities can say, listen, we really want a much lower ratio for gu uh, guidance counselor caseloads, and we want to hire extra guidance counselors. Or we have the space, and we really want lower class sizes, so we hire, want to hire extra teachers. That discretionary uh, money and, and decision making should be at the school level. So I think the hybrid approach is the right way to go, and not this what we have now. Clearly, I don't think anyone at this panel believes that we should continue the, on the path we are on. Uh, I just wanted to um, speak a little bit to um, what I know about when the formula was created and the idea of um, funding being distributed to schools based on need. And I know there was some discussion of that um, having some sort of redistribution effect in terms of where um, high quality teachers are um, located in schools. And um, I know there was a lot of discussion in the hope that maybe um, providing more funding to um, schools that were serving more challenging students would be able to attract um, better, better quality teachers. Um, so I, I think that that is definitely a tension in how the formula is used, and that's you know sort of what we're hearing um, from that perspective as well. But I think that that's um, also why we see a lot of high schools that are um, underfunded, and so that's also a function of how it was first implemented. And so these right. high schools were severely underfunded. Uh, now they're a little less underfunded. So. Um, you know, I think a lot of it is related to how, you know, as you were talking about, how it was implemented initially. Uh, council Member Drum. Council Member Drum. Yes, thank you. I um, think that many council members assume that the um, formula, the hybrid formula that you're talking about is thank exactly you, what's going on in the Department of Ed. So um, I think we'd have to do a little educating around that. But my question really today is to the IBO office. Because in, in your uh, testimony, you said that um, the $125 million turned into $78 million. Can you just tell me how that happens? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't mean to imply that it turned into $78 million. Um, I, was, um, I just wanted to make it clear that the analysis that we worked on focused just on funding that shows up in school budgets. But see, that's what we were told when we negotiated this. We were told that this was going to go directly into school budgets. So it includes pension and fringe costs that are centrally budgeted. Um, and so uh, it is true that it accounts for staffing at schools. However, not all of the funds that are needed for um, pension and fringe costs reflect, are reflected in school budgets. So how does the decision, and I should have asked the Department of Ed this, probably more than, but maybe you know since you did the report, how do they decide how this all comes about, like do, 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 do schools say to the Department of Ed, we need a new teacher, then you're going to have to split the cost, or how do they divvy up that funding into the school budgets? That's an excellent question, and I'm not sure, the, the question, you know, the reason why uh, we chose to look at what, what is on school budgets is that we're not sure at what point principals think about accounting for the pension and fringe costs of their um, staff. I, I, can, I can help with that. Yeah. Sure. Okay, fair student funding dollars, f just specifically fair student funding dollars normally come net of fringe costs. So in other words, if your teacher costs $100,000 and you have 100, if your teacher's salary is $100,000 and you have $100,000 in fair student funding money, you can afford that teacher. Other funding streams come with fringes attached. So for example, if you had a grant fund mm -hmm. that you, you applied for a grant and you got it from an outside source, you would then be able, then you would be required to pay fringe benefits on that. So you hire a $100,000 teacher, but that costs 140000 It was our understanding that this $125 million was fair student funding dollars net of fringe costs. But apparently it was not. It was a gross of $125 million that then was only gave you, say, 78 in purchasing power because of the fringe. So does that mean when we negotiate moving forward, we need to be more specific about how that money is yeah. used? Yeah, that's, that, that's accurate. The, the fact of the matter is, right, it, it's, 
a $100,000 salary cost, in effect, more than $100,000, just like whatever the net salaries of every educator or, or person in a school at any given time, whatever, whatever that uh, sum cost is, is actually much greater than that with, with fringe benefits. But we were under the impression that because it was fair student funding dollars, which are normally net of fringe, that this was also. You need to ask those questions when you're negotiating with them. So people right. who negotiate with them really need to ask those questions. So folks that say they went from 87 to 90 did not go from 87 to 90 if you're talking about the, the dollars that 87% generated versus the dollars that 90% generated. They really went from 87 to 89 or 88 and three quarters. So let me just go back to uh, IBO again. So with IBO, you said it was about $491 million Correct. Um, needed to bring everybody in. Mm -hmm. Does that include the fringe cost? That does not, no. Does not. Is that okay, yeah, okay. All right, now that I'm finance chair, I need to know these things a little bit better, yeah. so thank you. And I you. think that that um, uh, came out of the state uh, mandate to incorporate pension and fringe costs into what was reported to the state. Is, is there any um, idea about how class size reduction funding affects um, classroom teachers, et cetera, that you were talking about, like in terms of having a, a one budget that supplies everybody with the needed costs for personnel? Every, everything becomes discretionary at the school level in terms of how the money is utilized. So this is why the whole system is somewhat broken because you're sending money, you believe you have sent money to do something. But the school sees the money and they're like, I'm still trying to supply basic services, I'm using it for that. Mm -hmm. and, and the people inside of the system understand that's what's going on, but they seem perfectly willing to allow it to keep moving forward that way. And I've tried to assist people with budget appeals using that rationale. These dollars were for this, now give me my money for my teachers, mm -hmm. and it, it, it didn't work. Right, so I think one of the most interesting things I heard here today was that a school can be at 100% fair student funding but still not have all their needs met. Correct. Thank you. Well, I, I agree with that, uh, but the reason why we had the hearing on FSF is because out of all of the funding streams to a school, when you hear from school communities, this is the most precious funding stream because it's the most flexible funding streams. Title I, you can't play around with. Title III, you can't play around with. Uh, here, you have flexibility. In theory, if you were funded to meet all the needs of your students, and you, you, get, you can get creative with the budget, uh, because right now, I feel that folks are budgeting just at the fringes, just to, just to meet the bare minimum. But the minimum is, is still low. Again, there is this mindset that only students with IEPs have needs. That's not true. I, have, I, you know, I represent a community that sometimes deals with gun violence. Those students don't divorce that reality when they come to school the next day, even if they don't have an IEP. They need to speak to someone. But what if the elementary school doesn't have a guidance counselor or has a part-time guidance counselor or only works one day a week? So uh, I agree, President Mulgrew, that the formula itself was created at a time where leaders did not believe in public education. The formula is broken. And I agree that even if 100% funding, we would still be short. We still need the state to step up mm -hmm. as well. But uh, this is the city tax levy dollar. This is a very precious stream for our schools currently. And as we wade more and more into the, and by the way, I want to thank Chair Drum and this committee because we gave an education to the state and to many folks who did not know what FSF was, I think, prior to this year. Um, but we, we're currently dealing with the formula right now that says if you are poor in the fifth grade, you're on your own. That's the reality of the formula. Uh, and for some reason, they set the base rate for about $4,000 per student, goes up in middle school slightly, and then goes down in high school, and the schools that are facing the most significant challenges are in the high school level. 
And I, I used to teach high school, and I, I remember hearing from the DOE, college and career ready, college and career ready. We're not ready. Is the DOE ready to budget responsibly? No, it, it's clearly not. Uh, and so I, I want to thank all of you uh, for helping to provide us with critical information. Uh, there's a lot more work to do, and, but we're going to do it in consultation with you and our educators at the front lines uh, and not uh, chiefs of staff to the White House or, or professors from Canada. And so thank you very thank, much. Thank you for your questions, and it's, it's obvious you've done your homework also, so we appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Mr. Thomas Shepard. Uh, did anyone else sign up to speak because we don't have any more sign-up sheets? If not, uh, this hearing is then adjourned. <laughs>